All right, so um, let's get started. Today we will uh, do three uh, exercises. One is on how to use DFT in Quantum Espresso to do basic calculation uh, for cobalt oxide. Uh, in the second example, uh, we will learn how to compute Hubbard parameters on side Hubbard U and inter-side Hubbard V for the same system. And finally, once we have uh, we know those parameters U and V, we will uh, perform DFT plus U plus V calculation for uh, the same system. Okay, uh, I don't know if any of you is familiar with Quantum Espresso, but this is how the input file looks like uh, for uh, the standard DFT uh, calculation where we want to solve Consham equations. Let me briefly discuss uh, a few things. So on top, you can see that this, the type of this calculation is uh, SCF. You can see calculation equals SCF, which means this is the self-consistent field DFT calculation. Next, in the yellow block, we highlight the cell for this system. Cobalt oxide is uh, shown here. This is the, the, the simulation cell. In red, we highlight cobalt atoms. And in blue, we highlight uh, oxygen atoms. So this is anti-ferromagnetic system, which means we have uh, some cobalt atoms having spin up and other cobalts have uh, spin down. And these are actually going along the 111 direction, the diagonal, and there are planes uh, which are alternating uh, along 111 direction. So on one plane, we have all spins down. In the next plane, we have all spins up. Okay, um, then we have in the simulation cell just four atoms. So we say NAT equals to four. And we have three types of atoms. So you, you can ask why three, three types of atoms and not two. It's because we have one type of oxygen, it's shown here. But instead of having uh, just one type of cobalt, we have actually defined two types of cobalt uh, for the reason because we have uh, spin up and spin down. So basically we have two sublattices of, of cobalt. Cobalt one corresponds to uh, spin up and cobalt two corresponds to uh, spin down. Next in the, in the green box, we highlight cutoffs. Since quantum espresso is based on the plane waves. So we need to define cutoff, which is in this case, uh, 35 Rydberg, which is the cutoff for the wave functions and 280 Rydberg, the cutoff for the density and potential. So essentially we need to uh, imagine a sphere of some radius and the larger the cutoff, the larger uh, the radius of the sphere in which we have plane waves. Next, uh, we specify the parameter N spin two, which means this is the spin polarized uh, calculation and spin one would correspond to uh, non-spin polarized calculation. Again, uh, for cobalt one and cobalt two, we need to tell to the code uh, starting magnetization. This uh, number should go from zero to one or from zero to minus one. We need to have some initial uh, suggestion for the code. Let's say in this case, we say uh, 0.5 for cobalt one and minus 0.5 for cobalt two but we can change those numbers to any other numbers between zero and plus one, zero and minus one. So the final result should not depend on this, but in principle, it's good to, to verify because in magnetic systems, there can be multiple uh, uh, local minima in the potential energy surface. Okay, uh, cobalt oxide is actually metallic at the standard DFT uh, level of theory with LDA or GGA functionals. We know that already. For this reason, we need to tell to the code that we want to perform calculation for a metallic system, even though it's fake metal, but still we need to use uh, some smearing. In this case, this is MV, which stands for Marzari Vanderbilt uh, smearing with the broadening parameter of 0.02 Rydberg. There are also other uh, smearing functions like simple Gaussian or, um, or others. Uh, we want to solve Consham equations, but we need to tell to the code 
the accuracy or precision with which we want to solve those equations. In this uh, input file, we specify the convergence threshold equals 10 to the power minus 10, which is a quite good uh, choice in general. But of course, for each system, you need to uh, adapt this parameter because it's extensive. So the larger the system, so uh, the larger should be this parameter. Uh, in the uh, atomic species uh, card, we have to specify um, atomic masses, but in this case, actually, this doesn't matter, really. It matters when you compute, for example, phonons. And we need to specify the names of the uh, pseudo potentials. In this case, we uh, use pseudo potentials from the SSSP uh, pseudo potential library. I will explain in a moment what is this. And also from the name of pseudo potentials, we can see which functional exchange correlation functional we actually use. In this case, this is PB sol. It can be seen from the input uh, from the names of pseudo potentials. Then we specify uh, atomic positions. This can be done in different units. Uh, in this specific case, we specify them in crystal units. Same for uh, cell parameters. Uh, in a lot units, a lot units means uh, that cell parameters are in units of uh, actually this parameter cell DM1, which is eight uh, bore. And finally, we specify a K points grid. In this case, this is generated automatically. It's a uniform K point grid. And the size of this grid is three by three by three uh, with no shift with respect to the origin. Okay, uh, so I already showed you uh, the input file for cobalt oxide, but you may ask a question, but if I'm the beginner, uh, I never used quantum espresso, so I, I don't have experience to, ha to set up some initial guess for each of the parameters. So what shall I do? Uh, there is a solution to this problem because we can use the so-called quantum espresso input generator. It's an online tool which allows us to uh, generate input uh, automatically. Uh, basically, we need to provide uh, atomic positions for our system. You can uh, upload the crystal structure here in some, there are several formats. In one of them is a CIF file, CIF, which you can take from some uh, databases like ICSD, for example. Or you can uh, set up input by hand, but then you can upload it here. This uh, tool will uh, parse it and then will suggest better parameters if your, yours were not uh, properly chosen. Then we need to tell uh, to this online tool which to the potentials we want. Mm, we also should know a priori if this system is metallic or non-metallic. You can, for example, uh, check this from literature or perform some uh, preliminary calculation. Okay, for the K points, there are a couple of options depending on the uh, spacing distance between K points in the brilliant zone. You can choose fine spacing, which means 0.2, one more angstrom, but you can have also denser sampling of the, of the brilliant zone. And depending on the density of the sampling of the brilliant zone, you have different accuracy on the computed energies. So the more K points you have, the more accurate is your calculation, of course. Okay, so if you're interested in using this tool, uh, you can use the link below. And also in the previous slides, I mentioned about pseudo potentials and about SSSP uh, library. This is also uh, online on the Materials Cloud uh, website. Essentially, uh, in the past, it was an issue because each user has to choose somehow pseudo potentials. And there were, there were several pseudo potentials available on the web, uh, but it was not trivial at all to decide which pseudo potential to choose. So, and thanks to the uh, work done in, uh, by people in, in the group of uh, Professor Marzari, basically what was done, uh, our colleagues took different libraries which are available in the community and they tested all those pseudo potentials uh, against uh, all electron calculations, which don't use pseudo potentials at all. 
And then by, by analyzing different, uh, uh, different properties, which were computed with different pseudopotentials, they tabulated this, and then you can uh, choose which pseudopotential performs the best on average to describe different properties. And now if you need to say, let's say model cobalt oxide, you go here, you see for cobalt, we have uh, this color and for oxygen, uh, another color. And then based on the color, there's a color scheme and each color, color corresponds to specific pseudopotential library. So for example, for cobalt, I take pseudopotential from one library and for oxygen, I take it from another library. So now it's no longer an issue. You just go here and you choose the pseudopotentials that you need. Okay, so uh, before discussing our next step, which is non self consistent field calculation, let's switch to uh, quantum mobile. So, as you were um, informed by email, you should have already installed quantum mobile on your laptop or workstation. So, hopefully, uh, uh, many of you succeeded. If not, uh, you can just follow this hands on and try to, to do the exercises afterwards because unfortunately we don't have time to solve all installation problems. But uh, for those who manage to set up and install quantum mobile, you should have uh, this virtual machine running on your computer and then you can download material from this uh, web link onto GitHub you download the material on quantum mobile. And now we are ready to do the first exercise. So we go in the directory one uh, DFT. And uh, I would like to repeat, if you have any questions, you can ask in the chat, Edward and Fatima will answer. Or you can uh, interrupt me and we can discuss. Okay, so we're in the uh, repository for the first exercise for standard DFT. And we need to perform calculation uh, by using this file called cobaltoxide.scf.in. To do so, uh, we need to use code called pw.x. So this is the code of Quantum Espresso, which was already uh, installed in Quantum Mobile. So, okay, now we tell uh, the name of the code pw.x, which performs standard DFT calculation. Then uh, there is some problem. It got crazy. Okay, let me open again. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what happened with my keyboard. Apologies. Okay, we specify the name of the input and uh, the name of the output. Typically, the output file should have the same name as the input, but uh, in the end of saying in, we say out. And then we press enter. Okay, and we can see uh, the execution of the uh, of the calculation. You see it performed the first iteration, second, third, and so on until the code reaches the um, the converged solution with the precision ten to the power minus ten uh, readbook. It should take uh, about half a minute on one uh, core. So let's wait a little bit. If you're interested uh, to learn the basic features of Quantum Espresso, you can watch uh, videos on YouTube because there was extended uh, two weeks school uh, via Zoom just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So all was recorded so you can watch and learn more about this type of calculations. So, okay, the first step was done successfully. If we had more time, we could analyze the uh, output file of this 
calculation, you see it took 40, about 42 seconds. And this is our total energy and the Fermi energy. But there, are, there is much more information in this uh, output file. Okay, now we have the ground state for this system. Next, we want to perform a non-self-consistent field calculation. The input file is uh, almost exactly the same as uh, in the previous step. Uh, the difference is that we need to specify number of bands. Uh, in this case, uh, it's 40. So we have uh, some number of occupied states, concham states, but also we added some number of empty states because we want to, our goal now is to plot the projected density of states. So in the previous step, we just computed uh, occupied states, but now in this, this, this second step, we do it because we want to have also uh, un unoccupied states. But moreover, uh, in the previous step, we used k point mesh, which was three by three by three, which is quite scarce. And in this step, we increase the density of the k points. Now it is six by six by six. Uh, in principle, we can do the same calculation with ICF, but it will be just more uh, computationally expensive for the same k point grid. But uh, now, with in NSCF calculation, it's much cheaper because it's, uh, I mean, as you can see, it's, it's a non self consistent calculation. So, this is the reason why we do two calculations. First, SCF, where we converge uh, our wave functions and the density with some quite uh, um, optimally chosen K point mesh. But then we can do NSCF calculation with a denser K point mesh. So because we need to properly sample the brilliant zone uh, to plot uh, well-converged projected density of states. Okay, so this is done. Okay, before discussing the next step, let's go back to quantum mobile and perform this second equation. We use the same program pw.x. Now we need to read a different input, which is cobalt oxide uh, nscf.in. And we write the output in cobalt oxide uh, NSCF dot out. Okay, so at this second step, what uh, the program did, it uh, read uh, wave functions and the density from the previous calculation, which was converged to the ground state. And now it performs uh, NSCF, non self consistent field calculation for denser K point mesh. In total, we have 64 key points, as you can see. And now we are computing one by one uh, until we reach all uh, 64 key points. So it should take uh, a while. So we can uh, let it continue and uh, we can discuss the next step, which is uh, calculation of the projected density of states. This is a very fast step. Here we just need to specify the name, uh, the type of the uh, smearing function. In this case, it's we use simple Gaussian uh, broadening function. So we specify n Gauss equals to zero. And then uh, the value of the broadening for the Gaussian function is called D, D Gauss. And it's in units of Rydberg, not, not electron volt. So pay attention to the units. And it's 0.005. Rebirth. And finally, we need to tell to the code uh, energy interval in which we want to plot the projected density of states. We specify minimum energy and maximum energy. It's minus 15 and 30, respectively. And, this, and the step in energy, which is 0.01 uh, uh, Rydberg. No, sorry, it's in EV. It's in EV. So 0.01 EV. And then we use a script, which I already prepared, to plot. Uh, project density of states using files which are produced by this third step. All right, so let's go back to quantum uh, mobile. The calculation just finished. So let's perform this uh, third step. Uh, the name of the code that which we need to use now is called projwfc.x. 
then we read input from the file cobalt oxide uh, forge wfc.in and write output cobalt oxide forge wfc.out. This calculation is extremely fast, it takes just two seconds. And after this last step, you see the code produced quite uh, many files. So each of these files contains information about the projected density of states for each element. So you see cobalt one, cobalt two, oxygen. And moreover, for each element, you have several uh, files. For example, for cobalt, uh, or cobalt one, we have five files because what the code did, it computed a uh, projection of uh, wave functions on contrain wave functions on S states of cobalt, P states, D states, and again S and P, because it's for different principal quantum numbers. So what we want to do now is the last step is to use this uh, GNU plot script, which was already prepared, which reads information from this file, which is cobalt one uh, 3D. 3D states, projection on 3D states of cobalt one, and then projection on 3D states of cobalt two, and projection on P states of oxygen, one or the other, they are uh, the same. So what remains is just execute uh, the script. So we type GNU plot and the name of the script plot underscore PDOS dot GP. And this produces file called cobalt oxide underscore pdos dot eps. So we need to visualize it using evince, for example. Press enter. Okay, so this is the result. On the uh, y axis, we have pdos projected density of states in units of states divided by ev divided. It's per, per atom. And on the x axis, we have energy. Um, let me see. Energy min, uh, minus Fermi energy. So zero corresponds to the Fermi energy in EV. And then we have three spectra. Red one corresponds to cobalt 3D states, the majority spin. Green cobalt 3D states. Of the minority spin and blue oxygen 2p states. So we see that we have states exactly at the Fermi level, which are these green states, which are cobalt 3 uh, minority spin states. So we see that this is indeed a metallic. Cobalt oxide is metallic. But we know uh, from experiments that it is actually uh, insulating or semiconducting. So what we obtain is actually not correct. Because we used standard DFT with LD uh, with PB sol functional, which fails, because Professor Mazzari showed you there is self interaction error, and in this system it's strong for 3D states, and indeed we we verified now that it indeed fails. So now we need to do something, and the solution is this is what I just explained. The solution is to try to use DFT plus U plus V. Of course, uh, we can, if we had more time, we could try to use DFT plus U. But since the name of this uh, hands on, in the name of the lecture was extended Hubbard, so that's why we skip the standard DFT plus U calculation and we do uh, more advanced DFT plus U plus V so that you learn uh, how, how to use it if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so before performing DFT plus U plus V calculation, we need to know what are the values of Hubbard U and V parameters. So let's compute them. So brief reminder about the theory, in DFT plus U plus V, we have this uh, ex expression for the total energy, where we have the standard DFT total energy, plus some corrections. We have two corrections. One correction is which depends on the U, to, uh, U parameter. It's called the uh, effective on site Hubbard uh, U uh, parameter. And in the last term, 
it depends on inter site Hubbard B parameter. And N are occupation matrices. And if we look in this uh, perovskite system, U term describes atomic localization. So when you apply plus U correction, it wants to localize electrons more on transition metal ions, while intersite V does the opposite effect, as was uh, pointed out by Sergei. It does the opposite effect of that of plus U. So plus U wants to localize, as you can see on this cartoon. So it becomes more sharp. Uh, electronic states, the 3D states of cobalt. While when we include plus V, it wants to favor hybridization uh, or interaction with ligands, which are oxygen 2P states. So we see that the strengths, uh, the intensity of this peak goes down and it wants to uh, hybridize with ligand states. Okay, uh, as was also described in the lecture very briefly by Professor Marzari, um, Hubbard parameters are tightly connected to the uh, Hubbard projectors. Those Hubbard projectors are this function phi. N are occupation matrices, which depend on atomic index I, spin sigma, M1, M2 are magnetic quantum numbers. I index I labels uh, consham states. Fi is some occupations of consham states, like Fermi Dirac, for example. Psi I sigma are consham states and phi are some localized functions. This can be uh, atomic-like functions or one-year functions. One-year functions are not yet implemented for DFT plus U and plus U plus V in quantum espresso. I mean, maximally localized ones. Uh, so we can use now uh, atomic orbitals or orthogonalized atomic orbitals. And those are, um, so the, 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 the type of, of uh, orbitals which we want to correct are hard-coded in quantum stress at the time being. For example, in cobalt oxide, we want to correct 3D electrons of cobalt. So how to know that it is 3D of cobalt? And as I said, it's hard-coded in, in the routine, in the uh, repository called modules. There are two Fortran routines. One is called set Hubbard N, which is uh, setting principal quantum number N. And another one is called set Hubbard L, which is for, or standing for uh, orbital quantum number L. In our example of cobalt oxide, for cobalt, we have the principal quantum number three. So in this routine, you will see that for cobalt, we have N equals to three. And the orbital quantum number is two because we want to correct d electrons. Okay, so this is okay. And now we can go to the input file that we need to use for computing Hubbard parameters. So this input file is exactly the same that we saw before, but we added an extra uh, block of input keywords. First of all, we need to specify a keyword called LDA plus U equals to true. This is to activate the machinery of DFT uh, plus Hubbard. No notice that this name might look confusing to you because it's called LDA plus U. Because in, in, in practice, what we're doing, we're actually using PBE sol functional. So we want to do actually PBE sol plus U plus V. So nothing to do with LDA. But historically, uh, 30 years ago, when uh, plus U correction was introduced in DFT, it was called LDA plus U. So for this reason, historically, it's, we have this name. But in future versions of Quantum Espresso, we want to rename it in order to avoid confusion. Because nowadays, we not only use LDA plus U, but we use PBE plus U, PBE SOL plus U, SCAN plus U, you name it. So just keep in mind that in the future, we want to improve this. Then we need to specify another keyword, which is called LDA plus U kind. Uh, in this case, it's equals to true, uh, to two, sorry. Uh, there are several possibilities or options. Zero corresponds to uh, standard Duderov formalism, DFT plus U. 
One corresponds to a um, full uh, formulation by Liechtenstein. Again, it's just DFT plus U. You have also J there. And uh, two corresponds to extended uh, Deuter formalism, which where we have also plus V parameters. Then we need to specify U projection type. This is to control the type of the Hubbard uh, manifold or Hubbard projectors. As I said, currently we have two options, atomic or orthogonalized atomic. From our experience, orthogonalized atomic is uh, better. And there are also conceptual reasons why it should be better, but I will not go into discuss now. So we use orthoatomic. And finally, we need to specify Hubbard V parameters. So this is our first calculation and we want to compute Hubbard parameters, so we don't know them. So in practice, we need to put small but non-zero values. In this case, it's 10 to the power minus 10. This is just in order to activate the machinery of DFT plus Hubbard. So basically we're trying to activate uh, Hubbard corrections, but those corrections will not any, do any change to standard DFT energies. So that's why we put very small numbers. But again, this should be improved in the future because from the user point of view, this may be confusing. And then we need to specify a Hubbard V parameter. The detailed description is here in the documentation. There are three indices. Uh, in practice, we need to work only with the first two indices. The last index, let's keep it one always, because it's uh, if you change it from one to something else, it's for more advanced things, which we don't, don't want to do now. It's described here in the documentation, but just, uh, just keep it the last index one, at least in this uh, hands-on. Now, the first two indices, what are them? So this first two indices corresponds to the atomic indices, I and J, if you prefer, in our uh, notations. So in this specific example, we have to look in the card called atomic positions. We have cobalt one, cobalt two, oxygen, oxygen. So we have four atoms. So, and it's important to respect the order of these atoms. So one, one, one corresponds to cobalt one. So we specify one, one. Two, two corresponds to, this, to the cobalt two. And three, three corresponds to oxygen. We don't specify Hubbard V44 because this is yet another oxygen because uh, we already activated for one of the oxygens. Since two oxygens are of the same type, there is no need to specify for each of them. Just for one is, in, is sufficient. So in this case, we just specify Hubbard V33 for one oxygen and the code will automatically recognize another oxygen as also uh, to be considered in the calculation as a Hubbard atom. You can replace 3, 3 by uh, 4, 4. It will be also correct. Okay, so this is uh, it. Now we can start computing Hubbard parameters. It was uh, briefly mentioned in the lecture that Hubbard parameters are computed based on linear response theory. And recently we reformulated it uh, in, a, in a way which is computationally more elegant and more efficient and faster and even more accurate. And, and this is done using density functional perturbation theory. So the definition of Hubbard U is uh, shown here in this, with this formula, where we have the, the difference between inverse of the response matrices chi naught and chi. And those response matrices chi and chi naught are computed, uh, are defined, sorry, this way, for example, chi, which is the self-consistent response matrix, which depends on atomic indices i and j, is defined as the uh, response of uh, the occupation matrix with respect to the uh, lambda, which is the strength of the perturbation. So to compute Hubbard U, we need to perturb our system. And lambda is the strength of this perturbation. And what is the type of the perturbation is just a perturbation of uh, electronic occupations. 
So in our example of cobalt oxide, we are changing slightly the occupations of the 3D shell of cobalt. So we're removing a little bit of electrons or we are adding. And this will give us a response of occupation matrix, the n over d lambda. Then we sum up our spin sigma and magnetic quantum number m, and we obtain our desired response matrix uh, chi. And chi naught is defined in the same way, but it's a non-interacting counterpart. Actually, you can recognize that this equation in the red box is nothing but the Dyson-like equation. And these objects, uh, dn over d lambda, are computed using density functional perturbation theory. You saw this formula in the lectures where we need to uh, sum up over Q points. We have this phase factor and delta QN are responses to different monochromatic perturbations. And each perturbation has its specific uh, wave vector Q. So, so we, we are applying essentially a bunch of uh, monochromatic calculations, or, sorry, perturbations. We compute the response to each of them, then we sum up all responses and we obtain the Hubbard parameter. Apologies, this, this may be a bit too, too complex, but if you're interested, you're invited to, uh, to read these two papers at the bottom of this slide. So now how to use this uh, in practice, we need to consider now the input file for the HP calculation, because in quantum espresso, there is now a new code called HP which stands for Hubbard parameters. The input is, is extremely simple. We need just to specify the uh, density of the Q-point grid, uh, NQ1, NQ2, NQ, uh, NQ2, NQ3. In this case, it's a two by two by two. And also we need to specify the convergence threshold for the matrices chi. In this case, it's 10 to the power minus six. So, why do we use these parameters? Of course, a priori, we, we don't know. And, and as usual, we need to perform convergence tests. So this Q point grid has to be uh, tested. In this example, we use two by two by two. But of course, in, in, uh, for production, when you, in your research project, of course, you need to check different Q point meshes and see when your Hubbard parameters are converged. And the convergence threshold is 10 to the power minus six. Typically, this is a good value, but uh, typically it's in the range from 10 to the power minus five to 10 to the power minus eight. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's submit the calculation. So now we go out from directory one uh, underscore DFT and we go to this two Hubbard parameters. Here we need to perform the ground state calculation as I said before. So we type pw.x, read the input file cobalt oxide scf.in, and write the output in cobalt oxide scf.out. Again, this takes just half a minute. So this is first step, and the second step is uh, executing the calculation of the Hubbard parameters. In this case, we compute Hubbard U and V. Notice that this calculation uh, of Hubbard parameters is much, much more expensive than the ground state uh, DFT calculation because this is the uh, linear response calculation and we are applying several uh, perturbations. The symmetry of the system is reduced. And also there are some other technicalities. And for, for all these reasons, the calculation of Hubbard parameters is uh, time consuming. So next step, so we uh, run the uh, hp.x code. We read information from file cobaltoxide.hp.in and we write the output in the file cobaltoxide.hp.out and we press enter. Okay, so again, if we had more time, we could analyze in more detail the output. There is a lot of information there. Okay, 
so you can see immediately that with one core it's already super slow it's just working on the first iteration so while it's working i can go a little bit up and show you relevant information so you see that there is a list of two atoms which will be perturbed so we will perturb the atom number one which is cobalt one we will not perturb cobalt two because it's equivalent to cobalt one they differ only by spin so there is no need to perturb cobalt two so we, we gain a lot of time thanks to, to this the symmetry and also we perturbed uh, atom number three which is oxygen so why do we perturb oxygen? Because we want to compute Hubbard V. So we need to know the response also of oxygen. So we have two atoms which will be perturbed. And for each of these atoms, we have a grid of Q points. And we need to uh, perform calculation for each Q point separately. They are independent. So we can efficiently parallelize the calculation over Q points. And over uh, perturbed atoms. So if we have two atoms, and for each atom we have four Q points. So we have eight calculations in total. So now we are running calculations for the first cobalt atom and the first Q point, but we have uh, other three. So you see that it's already progressed quite a bit. It's just still you can see atom one, Q point one, iteration nine. And it's computing chi matrix elements. And this is the residue, you see? And we specified the residue should be 10 to the power of minus six. So there is still quite a long way to go. So maybe 10 more iterations. But this will be just first Q point. There are another three. So it will take actually with one core uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes, or maybe half an hour. So of course we will not wait. Uh, so I can kill this calculation. And if if you have quantum mobile on your workstation, you can go to the folder called reference. Here you find already the, the final results, you see. And in particular, the code will generate file called uh, Hubble parameters dot in parameters dot out. So if we open uh, this file cobalt excited Hubble parameters, we will see that here we show information for Hubble U. So you see that for cobalt one, we obtain value of Hubble U 6.64, cobalt two 6.64. So they are equal, it's expected. But we have Hubbard U also for oxygen, which is 8.675. But we don't want to use U for oxygen because uh, two P states of oxygen are more extended. So even though we have them in the output, but we don't use them in the production calculation. So we just use U uh, for cobalt. And then below you have uh, Hubbard V parameters uh, adapted for a supercell three by three by three. I will explain in a moment what is this. And basically, we have atom one, atom two, distance between atom one, atom two, and the value of the Hubbard V in EV. And we have the first column, uh, our atom one, which is cobalt one. And then we have all its neighbors. So atom two are its neighbors. You have index one, 55, 47, and the type of the atom. So the distance between them. So the, for the first row, we have distance zero, which means it's actually we're sitting on the same atom. And this is actually Hubbard U because when we have Hubbard V whose index is one, one, it's actually Hubbard U. So it's 664, it is the same as here. And the next six are its uh, six nearest neighbors. You see that the distance is uh, all the same in this case. And the value of the Hubbard V is 0.49 EV. It's all the same because in our case, in this example, the system is very symmetric. But in uh, more complicated systems, material, there are complicated distortions, rotations, uh, disproportionations. So, of course, distances will be different and Hubbard V will be slightly different. And if you go down, you will see for the second cobalt, 
etc. And in parameters.out, it's the same information, but just the one which we need for the DFT plus U plus V calculation. So basically we have first atom with its six neighbors, and second atom with its uh, six neighbors. So now let me explain a little bit more this. So this is what I just explained, how, uh, how the meaning of, of the information in the parameters.out file. We see, again, in Magenta, I highlight this is Hubbard U for Cobalt 1, Hubbard U for Cobalt 2, and green are for the Hubbard V between Cobalt 1, 3D, and its six nearest neighbors, oxygen to P, and for the second Hubbard. So now the question you, you have, I guess, is what is the meaning of these strange indices for atom two? Why are these so large and what is this? N now let's discuss this. So let's consider a two-dimensional case for simplicity. Let's have, uh, let's imagine we have a square uh, cell, primitive cell, and we have just two atoms. One is black, another is red. So what we need to do is actually uh, construct a three by three supercell. We took our blue or primitive cell and we repeated it along three, uh, two, two directions, X and Y, because we're in two dimensions. So we do this because we're using periodic boundary conditions in quantum space. So we repeated our cell and we repeated bl uh, black and red atoms in each of them. Uh, but notice that this is, doesn't mean that we actually have a real supercell. So we don't need to do any supercell calculation. This is done, we, we need to say that this is virtual three by three supercell. So this is done internally by the DFT plus U plus V code. So this is just, I will explain why. But in, in reality, we don't have supercell. This is a virtual supercell. Next, we label them uh, by numbers. So our real atoms are one and two, and then we have three, four, et cetera, uh, until 18. And then for example, for atom one, which is cobalt one in our case, we can now determine its neighbors. We have atom two, which is its neighbor. We knew it from the beginning, which is because it's in our primitive cell. But then now we can tell what are other neighbors because they are in neighboring uh, periodically repeated cells like 12, 14, and 16. Because if we don't do that, we have just this, we have one, two, we have just one neighbor. But of course, uh, we have other neighbors if we do re periodic repetitions. So that's why, this is the reason why we do it. And now coming back to our three-dimensional case for uh, cobalt oxide, so we do in three dimensions, three by three by three virtual supercell. And for cobalt one, we have six neighbors because we have octahedra. And we have, this is why we have these weird numbers, 23, 20, 12, 44, 55, 47. So if I go back, you can recognize them, 55, 47, 23, et cetera. It's because of this virtual three by three supercell. Okay, so now we are ready for the last step and we actually have just two minutes. So I don't do it on quantum mobile, but just show you here uh, on the slides. So first step is the SCF. Now uh, in yellow, this is what you already saw, LDA plus U true for atomic Hubbard projectors. We do DFT plus U plus V. And in blue, this is new. We need to add this keyword called Hubbard parameters equals file. So with this, we tell to the code to look for the file called parameters.in where the code will find Hubbard U and Hubbard V parameters. And note that we changed the name from parameters.out to parameters.in, just to not to get confusion, just to keep track of what we are doing. And then do we do the second step in SCF, again, uh, we with, with specify number of bands, uh, denser key point grid, but the same uh, Hubbard keywords. And the last step is the, for the projected density of states, the same, no changes. And if we do that calculation, so we will obtain figure on the right, DFT plus U plus V, and we see that we have a band gap. So we go from the metallic 
spurious and physical solution to the correct insulating uh, solution, which is in agreement with the experiment. So in cobalt oxide, uh, okay, let me comment about this in a moment. Uh, another important remark is that we can compute and we should compute self uh, Hubbard parameters self consistently. So we start with some initial gas on U and V, let's say it can be zero, but it can be also finite values. Then we perform uh, DFT plus U plus V, SCF ground state. Then we use linear response theory to compute Hubbard parameters. We call them U out and V out. Then we perform structural optimization using Hubbard corrections. And then uh, if our output parameters differ from the input parameters by some threshold, in the first iteration, they can be probably U input V input zero, and you output the output like 6 EV, 5 EV. So of course we don't satisfy this condition. So we go back, we initialize U input and V input to U output V output, and we continue the loop until parameters do not change and our geometry is converged. So this will be our self-consistent structure and uh, self-consistent Hubbard parameters. So if you are interested in more details, you can check this paper. And last, uh, this is for uh, further reading. These are four examples showing that Hubbard, interside Hubbard V is important in quite many cases. Maybe it's not that important in cobalt oxide because it's quite simple and DFT plus U should work already well, but we considered it just because it's a simple system, but these are complicated examples and you're invited to, to check them.